and welcome to Malibu, California and Pepperdine's Graduate School of Public Policy. I'm Pete Peterson, the Dean of the School of Public Policy, and I'm delighted to have you back for the next episode of Office Hours with Victor Davis Hanson. Dr. Hanson is our Giles O'Malley Distinguished Visiting Professor this fall, teaching a class titled Roots of American Leadership. Over the course of this four-part series, we are essentially welcoming you in to Dr. Hansen's classroom, exploring topics that he's covered with our graduate students the day before. So far, we've looked at the generals of Themistocles and Patton, and today we are going to be looking at the life and leadership of William Tecumseh Sherman. I'm delighted to have back uh, Dr. Victor Davis Hanson. Victor, great to have you back. Thank you for having me. I thought where we start on this um, discussion, again, for those that have not uh, seen our other videos, just to talk initially about the class that you're teaching, Roots of American Leadership. This is a graduate course, and so our graduate policy students are going off into careers ranging from local government to the intelligence uh, services, the foreign service and so forth. Why do you think it's important to, uh, for these students to understand leadership through the lens of military leaders? Well, I, I think too often we look at leadership just in terms of political offices, civilian offices, elected offices, or maybe inspired civil servants. But war being a different phenomenon, so it it sort of collapses time and space and it takes off the veneer, to use Thucydides' terms, and it shows human nature for what it is. So there are certain people who thrive in peace and then they don't perform well in war and vice versa. So I think a lot of the tr attributes of, of leadership in general can be found in some generals, not everybody. I mean, we have. Ulysses S. Grant was probably a better president than people thought. Mm -hmm. Eisenhower was a very good president. Uh, Zachary Taylor may have been a good, Washington was a good president. So mm -hmm. more or less, they tend to be better than not. But they bring a different type of experience to it. And I think, not that civilians can emulate that, but it's, it's, they can serve as models. They're certain, and they tend to be less of a consensus builder and more because of the chain of command. And so we, we tend to be, we emphasize in civilian leadership, we have to be a consensus builder. You have to go through channels, you have to go through, but every once in a while you, you get to an ossified, calcified state. Mm -hmm. And then you, what type of leadership breaks that log jam and without being a demagogue or something. So I think that that's the, the point of it. And so I wanted to look at uh, generals, but a prejudicial view, they're all from consensual societies. So Themistocles, Paminondas, Belisarus, uh, Sherman Patton, Matthew Ridgway, and David, they were all products of give and take in a, a, a constitutional system of some sort. Maybe Justinian would, might be a little stretching it a bit with Belisarus, but, and in, so it has to have a model where students can see that these people of the past functioned in a type of society in which they are aspire to lead. I hope it's becoming apparent to the viewers of this series that we're beginning to pull out some themes across these leaders. And as you say, uh, themes that are important, not just for military leaders, but for any public leader. Uh, some of these themes have to do with the individual lives of the people that we're exploring. And again, today we'll be looking at William Tecumseh Sherman, but also in the way that they have worked within uh, large bureaucracies, how they've set cultures, and, and frankly, how they've carried out uh, their work as military leaders. Each of these themes, I think, are worth touching on. And I thought where we begin with with Sherman, and uh, I'm going to be drawing from uh, your excellent book, The Soul of Battle, uh, in looking at Sherman's life, and particularly this, uh, his time in the, the, the so-called March to the Sea. But I wanna back up a little bit because you also look into uh, Sherman's own biography. And in this, there are some ties to some of the other leaders that we've seen. Yeah. And in particular, in this area of 
uh, a life that could only be described as a failure leading up to their great success. We saw that in Patton. We've seen that in Themistocles. We'll see that in uh, others that we look at. But I wanted to draw out uh, this particular passage and just get your feedback on the importance of leaders overcoming failure. So this uh, particular uh, part here, quote, when the march to the sea began, William Tecumseh Sherman was 44 years old. Until a mere two years earlier, Sherman had been acknowledged by both himself and others as an abject failure, chopping down. Since graduating from West Point in 1840 at the age of 20, he had for the next quarter century held nearly a dozen jobs, itinerant army officer, failed bank official, manager of his father-in-law's properties, road construction administrator, self-taught lawyer, notary public, vegetable peddler and broker, farmer, trader and speculator, military academy superintendent, and railroad supervisor. He was plagued by continual ill health, mostly asthma and probably clinical depression, and he was for all practical purposes broke and dependent on continual subsidies from his father-in-law. Like Patton, his family wealth and political connections tended to exaggerate rather than ameliorate his own sense of personal setback. Yeah, the problem with Sherman like Patton was, Patton married into one of the wealthiest, fam the Ayer family, and that a comparable family in the 19th century was the Ewing family of Ohio. They were well-connected, they were in government and law and very wealthy. And he had, he was an orphan, he was adopted by him, and so he married his stepsister. Mm. And that hung over him, that he had to perform or he had to be his own man's and not take subsidies. Because his wife was always trying to say, don't worry, dad will take care of us. So that was a burden because he was always sort of criticized that, well, your father's always your insurance policy. And the thing about all those jobs that he had they were all prerequisites for what he became, mm. same way with Patton, but he didn't know it at the time. So had there not been a civil war, he was out of the military. He was, uh, he was the uh, commandant of what would become Louisiana State University, but it was a military academy. And mm -hmm. he was a northerner in the South. And he admired Southern values, but he detested slavery and he detested uh, succession. And so when they succeeded, he did something that was very brave and said, you know what, I'm going to have to go back up. And that was the first good job he'd ever had. Mm -hmm. And he was, he was performing excellently and right. he was widely admired. Now, this was a school that eventually, it was started out as a military academy yes. in Louisiana, eventually became Louisiana State University. It did. Okay. And he was the first president, right. the equivalent of the president. And for him to, to see that all, and he had most of his classmates at West Point, the best students were on the Confederate side. So here he was in Louisiana. He, he was reunited with a lot of people in the U.S. military that were succeeding. And they were going to join the, this new film. And he warned them that you, your Scotch-Irish martial values won't go much against an industrial people. And you think these people are weak and they're, they're not brave and they're not agrarian. But they're some of the toughest people in the world and don't judge the Union just by the East Coast. But there's a whole nother population where I, William Tecumseh Sherman are from in Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Minnesota, Michigan. And he, he tried to convey that not only could the South not match them industrially, but he really got them angry because he said, I know these people and they are yeoman farmers and they're tougher than you people and if they come down here, you will regret it. And he warned it. So then he went back and they were short officers. And of course, it turned out that all of these things that you mentioned, if you were going to be a colonel and then very quickly a brigadier general, and you had to form an army out of nothing, you needed some idea of the finances of it, where the money came, you need the logistics. He, had, he knew how to, he was a teamster. You, knew, you need to know the fine prints of civilian law you needed to know about uh, food and supply and horses. And he had all that experience. And so he just, he had a meteoric rise. And then of course, he had certain traits that weren't compatible 
with any bureaucracy he'd ever been in, and they quickly manifested themselves. So it was just a question of would his honesty and his bluntness get him fired before he could be of value? And so he was made a commandant of what was essentially Cincinnati, but all of Ohio. And he warned people, my God, 90-day enlistment's not going to do it. You saw what happened at Bull Run. That was not an aberration. You're not ready for war. We're going to have to raise over a million men, and we're going to have to kill 300,000 of these cavaliers. And every, the headline said, Sherman insane, Sherman lost his mind, Sherman predicts four or five years of bloody war, and they relieved him. Mm -hmm. And then he said, I, I deserve it, I'm crazy. He was suffering from terrible allergies and asthma. And then his wife went to work, just like Patton's wife did, and saved him. And then he happened to remember a younger person who was just as eccentric, just as brilliant, and uh, also had been a grocer in Galena, Illinois, Ulysses S. Grant. Mm -hmm. And he gave him a chance. And Grant had had taken off after the victories at Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson. And they hadn't had any victories in the West. So suddenly Grant is given an army. And the first thing he does is bring crazy Sherman out of retirement. <laughs> and I'll give him a division. And he gave him a division at the Battle of Shiloh that turned out to be the focal point mm -hmm. of the greatest battle since the Revolutionary War. And Sherman performed magnificently. And Grant may not have, it's disputable, but he probably was drinking, he wasn't at the battlefield. Sherman woke up two days later after the battle, which was a great Union victory. He had been shot, wounded, slightly wounded, three sh horses shot out from under him. All of a sudden, Sherman saves right wing at Shiloh, the rock of Shiloh, and then Grant drinking, missing, and Sherman did a very great thing. He, he supported Grant. Mm -hmm. and later. And they asked him why, and he said, when I was crazy, when I was said to be crazy, Grant stood by me, and when, when he said to be drunk, I'm gonna stand by him. And that forged this, leader, this partnership of two failures that turned out to be wildly successful in the Civil War. And they were authentic military geniuses, and the thing about their partnership was they were very different. They had very contrasting views. One was a Clausewitzian, I'm going to hit the enemy and destroy the army, and then they won't have any wherewithal to fight us. And the other, Sherman said, not, in, uh, not with cannon and modern weapons, and uh, you'll kill, you'll destroy your army, so I'm going to destroy the psychology, the sociology, the economy of the enemy, then the army will die on the vine. But they were compatible. They weren't antithetical. So mm -hmm. it was basically, Grant said, you do that, and I'll do this, and each one will enhance each other, as long as you don't take credit and I don't take credit. So I won't say I won the war, and you don't say you won the war. And that was a beautiful relationship. So, so much of Sherman's life, which had been seen as this string of failures, actually perfectly prepared him for this moment. I want to talk a bit about the culture and the shaping of culture by leaders. One of the points that you've made in uh, several of these biographies, we, we looked at uh, Patton and his understanding of the, of the culture of his army, that it wasn't just enough to have more guns and more men and better training. There needed to be a certain esprit de corps. There needed to be a certain identity. Sherman is leading the Army of the West, and of course, yes. the West at this time is Ohio. Yes. Um, but in that, there's this identity to those troops that you note several times is very different than Grant's army. So the, the Army of the Potomac, the Army of the East. And in some ways, Sherman is perfectly prepared to lead that kind of army, the Army of the West. And... There's one point in here, and I, I wanted to get your reflection on how much of Sherman, Sherman's leadership was taking the existing culture of the Army of the West and how much of it was shaping it, mm -hmm. right? So at one point you say, and this is quoting Sherman himself, there is a soul to an army as well as to the individual man, and no general can accomplish the full work of his army unless he commands the soul of his men as well as their bodies and legs. 
The South was about to discover the soul of the Army of the West as it headed to the coast, and so would learn the same terrible lesson that Epimondus had taught the Spartans so very long ago. Well, he, he has shared one trait with Grant, and you know, in that terrible summer of 1864, right when they were in the bloodiest part of the continuing Cold Harbor, all of that, people came into Grant, his division commanders, and said, General Grant, General Grant, General Lee's doing this, General Lee's doing this. He said, I'm so sick of hearing what General Lee's doing, you better worry what we're going to do to him. And that was the same idea with Sherman. They said, we're going to, you can't go down there. These people, uh, they love to duel, they love to fight. The, Wade Hampton is the best horseman in the, and he said, you better worry what we're, we're going to do to them. Because he was trying to imbue a confidence and he would get his commanders at the campfire at night. He couldn't sleep I and mean, he'd smoke cigars nonstop. And he would say to them, we got all these people here are agrarian farmers. They're not uh, slaves, they're not serfs, they're not plantation owners. They know how to work outside, they know how to plow, they know how to ride a horse, they know how to horseshoe. They know all the things we need. And all they need to be told is they're better than anybody else. And the Army of the Potomac was in that Boston, New York, Philadelphia corridor. So most of it was urban. A lot of it was immigrant. They were suffering riots from Irish immigrants. Mm -hmm. They had new uniforms. They were on cutting edges. Of, they were in the press the whole time. Nobody really knew about this other army. So Sherman was trying to tell them we're going to have an identity. We're not going to have new uniforms. If your uniforms are old and torn up, that's the, all the better. You're going to be suntan. You're going to live outdoors. And when people said, you can't cut your supply lines and go to Atlanta, much less cut it from Atlanta to Savannah, he said, ask the soldiers. They know what it's like right after harvest. That's when there's hams hanging in the smokehouse. That's when uh, there's fruit. That's when they're drying apples. That's when they bring in everything. And these guys know how to farm, and they're going to go through it like a scythe through wheat, mm. and they know, and uh, they're not afraid of anybody. And so all he had to do was be one of them. So they couldn't distinguish him by the way he dressed. And so when he would go through, they, they, they thought, wow, this guy's the head of the yard, largest army now in the United States, probably the largest, one of the largest armies in the history of that mobility, 65,000 men and he's got old clothes, and he doesn't have medals, or he doesn't have braid, and he stops and he asks people, you know, what are you doing? Hi, how, is that horseshoe? Let me get off and help you. How, how, let me look at your Navy pistol, let's see this, and you need a cigar, he pulled out one, mm -hmm. and, he was, and so they started calling him Uncle Billy. He was, you know, 44 years old, mm -hmm. he was Uncle Billy, and suddenly he grew into it. So he had lifelong afflictions where he could hardly breathe, and eventually he'd die of, of throat illness. But for that campaign, all of his um, symptoms went away. And it would be, I mean, he was smoking more cigars than he ever had. He was up all night. He was sleeping on the ground. You'd think that he would be almost dead. Asthma disappeared. Allergies disappeared. He said he felt great. And part of it was the psychology of creating this huge mobile city of Westerners and he was trying to introduce to the United States this new ethos of the West. Mm -hmm. And they weren't really familiar with it. Mm -hmm. And when, he, when the war was over, I, I have a chapter in that book about the parade. Yes. And when they look at them, they, here comes the Army of the Potomac and all of the, they have beautiful you know, uniform. And then this mob comes in with black pioneers that he had freed with pickaxes and shovels. And then all these guys are pretty big, a lot of them were Scandinavians uh, that settled in Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota. And they were tan, and they were in rags, and uh, I think that one of the German attaches I recall said something like, this is the scariest army I've ever seen. Yes. They could go right through anybody in Europe. And people thought he would, so he did try to create, uh, an, I don't know what, a spirit of core. Well, and you say here, just to uh, support that point. Quote, Sherman's was an army that was wilder and more rugged than the other Northern Corps, and yet still far better equipped, disciplined, organized, and more lethal. Uh, 
than the battle-hardened veterans of the South it opposed in 1864. Yeah, I think the, the problem of the Army of the Potomac was that they were in a, an unenviable position of attacking Robert E. Lee and the one thing that he was really good at. He wasn't a good, aggressive commander as we knew at Gettysburg. Had he been Sherman and gone into Pennsylvania, he would have avoided, he would have avoided uh, Gettysburg and probably burned down <laughs> Pittsburgh and then gone to Philadelphia and looted it and humiliated him and then come the backside of Washington and torched it and the war would have been over. But he, he didn't think like that. He was a Clausewitzian hmm. and he didn't have the resources to do that. But you put him out in front of Richmond and you give him the material and the wherewithal and the manpower to dig and fortify and it was like, as I said earlier, it was like Grant was a ram hitting this wall, and he kept thinking, I'm gonna break it, I'm gonna break it, I'm gonna break it. And what it was doing was destroying morale, mm. and it was a revolving door army. So people came in, they were there for, from May all the way until late summer, and they either died or got wounded, and there, there was over 100,000 casualties. Mary Todd Lincoln, the president's wife and first lady, said that he was a butcher. She hated him. Mm. She had Southern sympathies, but Sherman's idea was, I'm gonna get all of you guys that we start from Tennessee, we're gonna cut our lines, we're gonna be self-supporting. When you get to Atlanta, I'm not gonna tell you where we're gonna go, but we're not gonna end. And none of you are gonna die because we're gonna overwhelm, outmaneuver, outmarch, and starve to death these armies. And that's exactly what he did, and he kept them alive. And when you think that they were, they didn't look like they were an army because they mm. were out camping every day, he was just like Patton, though. He had much uh, more consideration of what it was like to be a soldier than the other general, generals on either side. So he did just what Patton said. Are your clothes warm? Are your clothes dry? Do you have good socks? Mm. Are you, do you have the latrine in the right place? Where is the drinking water coming from? Every little minutia. And he had that background. You yeah. have all these different occupations that allowed him to do that. I want to... Now draw our attention and uh, look at this, at the March to the Sea. We're in November of 1864. And one of the other themes that we've been touching on in the other sessions that we've had here is the genius of these leaders. Some of it can be seen as possibly prophetic. Some of it is certainly forward thinking, looking at trend lines and then following them out. But it's worth noting how historic Sherman's set of decisions were in Georgia in 1864. I wanna start here and then get your thoughts on the importance uh, for leaders in thinking, well, I guess the term today would be outside the box. Well, we're gonna get into the specifics of the decisions he made, but just how different they were at the time for Sherman. So quoting here, Sherman's men were already a part of something hitherto unseen in American military history. A mass of 65,000 troops, entirely self-contained, possessed of lethal destructive power, unmatched by any other infantry force in the history of conflict, lightning quick, absolutely unstoppable, but and but a few days old. I, I think it goes back to what we talked about with Themistocles. There's certain military minds, civilian, they have pronoia, that foresight. So when he, he cooks up the idea, it, it has to combine so many theories and aggregate them. We have to have an, he has to understand that when you go down south, you can't be supported by the railroad because they'll break it up, guerrillas were. Mm -hmm. So you have to have soldiers that know how to take care of themselves. If you get in a big decisive battle, you're gonna get wounded. And what do you do with them? You're out in the enemy territory. You're way be beyond your lines. So you're gonna try to outmaneuver them and cut off their supplies. And then when you get to Atlanta, what are you gonna do? You're out, you take the city, and then are you just gonna hold it? Most people would've. Right. But he's saying, we're gonna destroy it as a transportation hub, and then we're gonna go, keep moving. And so his idea was, 
we're going to make little ink spots all the way around from Tennessee to Atlanta to Savannah to Columbia, South Carolina, and we're going to get up to Lee. And these ink spots are going to grow and aggregate until finally it's a northern presence throughout the south. But think of the strategic imagination that extended even to politics. So he's thinking, Abraham Lincoln, if he's not elected, we're not going to be able to finish the Civil War because uh, on the one hand, Fremont is running, thinks he's going to run in the, Fremont, uh, in the uh, primaries. Right. And he wants to completely have the emancipation apply to all the border states. And he wants to announce they're never going to let the South back. And he's going to alienate the Copperheads. On the other hand, McClellan, if he's elected, he's going to have a negotiated settlement with the Confederacy. And it's all for naught. There's going to be two nations. So somebody has to re revitalize Abraham Lincoln. Because mm. after that summer of 1864, they lost more men in that, those 90 days than they had the entire war. So Sherman is already thinking, I've got to do something iconic. So what if I took the third most important city in, in uh, the Confederacy, but more importantly in Georgia? And then what if I told everybody after I took it, I, that I was going to head right through the plantation capital of the Confederacy. And so he, the whole time he was fighting, he said, I've got to get there before November. And he gets there on September 2nd, plenty of time. And he sends that famous message, At Atlanta is ours and fairly won. And suddenly, there was no McClellan candidacy. I mean, he still ran, but it just, mm. Phew, mm. It just deflated. And you, when you look at the t contemporary Horace Greeley type newspapers. It was Sherman lost in Georgia, Sherman on wild goose chase, Co Southern Cossacks will cut, cut him into pieces. And then he gets to Atlanta and says, Sherman saves Union, Sherman hero, Sherman greater than Grant, Sherman bigger than you, Sh Sherman for president. Right. And it was just, it, but he had planned this out and he understood politics in a way that Grant didn't, didn't or maybe Grant did understand politics, but understood that he wasn't the agent to affect the election. And so later when they asked Sherman, he, he said, uh, he grabbed him from, he grabbed the Confederate from the front, and then I came around the back and kicked him in the pants, or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, he tied down Lee, and he tied down Southern resources so I could go around. And Grant said, you know, he, he went around and destroyed their economic and psychological social resources, so that made my job easier. I don't know to what degree either view was true, but they saw it as a combination. But the political genius was not Grant, it was Sherman. And he didn't want any higher office, yeah. unlike, unlike Grant. Grant. I want to go into this last part that you just mentioned about the psychological, cultural aspect of this. Um, we saw that in Themistocles, we saw that in Patton, where they understood their role as a military leader as not simply taking a patch of real estate or winning particular battles, but they saw that this as a much larger cultural undertaking that needed to happen, and again, we we've touched on the importance of irony in many of these stories, that in setting this grandiose vision, if you will, for the importance of this march to, sea, to the sea, which we'll get into with Sherman, that the aggression, the violence, the, the rhetoric, as violent as it was, was really focused on reducing casualties to the maximum number of pos possible. And so this aspect of Sherman's design was not simply strategic in the sense that we're gonna go here, 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 and here, but we're doing this in order to break the will of our enemy. And so I wanted to draw off this paragraph here and then get your, your response to how Sherman was envisioning this military strategy, not just through the lens of, of, of taking military objectives, but really to see it through the lens of a, a psyche of the enemy. 
quote, the army of Sherman was now exposing one of the great embarrassments of the chivalric apartheid society. Rhetoric, costumes, polite manners, titles, and arcane traditions among a privileged elite hide weakness rather than reflect strength. An egalitarian society of freeholding citizens that can draw on all members of its population, make them feel of equal value to the cause, and sanction their brutality by a true democratic consensus, needs no emblems of ferocity because it is intrinsically ferocious, even scary in war, both numerically and qualitatively. Yeah, I, I think Epaminondas was dealing with the killers of the ancient world, the Spartans. Everybody was afraid of them, but there was only 10,000 of them. He got an army of 70,000 people, and he imbued them with the idea that we were part of the Theban democratic experiment. And Patton had the same problem. He was dealing with killers, SS, and German veterans from the Eastern Front, and he was dealing with 18-year-old, 19-year-old recruits. And so it was necessary, like Epaminondas, to give them confidence, and give them confidence by marching and taking ground, but not because ground was intrinsically strategic, but to get them into places to surround them and think of them holistically. So in the case of Epaminondas, it was free the helots, and they can't, they'll have to farm themselves. Put democratic cities around them, but more importantly, humiliate them. Go down and cross the Eurotas River, and they had bragged no one in 700 years had ever done that. In the case of Sherman it was, I've got to keep this army alive and I'm dealing with a martial culture that puts a high premium on masculinity and military traditions, so I've got to humiliate it. And these are the best people to do it because they're tougher, they're better shots, and the South doesn't have a middle class. It's got a bunch of plantation grandees and it's got poor white people and mm -hmm. it's got four million slaves. So they don't have anything like what we do. And when we're going to go down there, we're going to taunt them. We're going to say, your newspapers dared us to come, and here we are. And so when Sherman, they would hand Sherman a paper, the Macon, Georgia paper or something, he said, Sherman to sh shortly meet his fate when Southern uh, Cavaliers surround him. He said, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Where are they? We'd like nothing better to have it out with you. And Patton was the same way. He was trying to tell people that they could defeat SS killers, even though they were uh, from a democratic society. And I think all three of them, but especially Sherman, kind of taught us all a lesson that these armies are very slow to wrath mm -hmm. and they don't like to fight. They don't, they're not preemptive. Mm -hmm. But if you keep poking them and poking them and poking them and they finally galvanize, then there's no stopping them because they represent a consensus of the population. It's not Hitler it's not uh, Jefferson Davis, but they've got everybody behind them. Mm -hmm. So there's no appeal like, well, maybe we shouldn't have this. Well, you voted for it, you want it, and now we've, we've set it off in motion and it's hard to stop. So the United States, that was always something about the United States that it was loath to go to war, but once it did, it was pretty much uh, murderous in the way that it destroyed its enemies until, you know, the Cold War perhaps. But Again, we didn't have the consensus. Once you get the consensus, and Sherman talked about that all the time, just like Pat and just mm -hmm. like Matthew Ridgway, they, he talked about why are we here? And look at slaves, look at how they're treated. Look at these plantation people. They talk about all how tough they are, they just abandon their plantation. Their women are here. The southern women are tougher than the men. Mm -hmm. And he, he lectured all the time. He had no, you know, he had no um, fear of the Confederate martial class. And a lot of people did, and they thought that they couldn't stop them. And so, and he would lecture, you talked about strategy, he, he tried to explain to people that there was a reason why they were down there. They couldn't just sit up north, because if you just sat up north, you would eventually have an armistice, and the, the lines would be unbroken. And the South had an advantage. The South did not have to go take the north. All the South had to do was say, we're separate. Mm -hmm. We don't want your land, you want our land. You want to unite us, we don't. we don't. But we don't want to tell you what to do. If you don't want slaves, fine. 
but you're poking your nose in our business. That was their propaganda. Mm -hmm. And so Sherman said, we have the unenviable task of going in and trying to conquer and occupy and persuade and teach an area the size of Western Europe. And that's gonna be very hard unless we go down there and we preserve this army. A lot of modern, even modern military historians mistake what he did. They'll say, well, he, he didn't fight Hood head on, or he, he could have stopped Joe Johnson earlier, or he avoided. Well, they didn't understand that his point was he had 65,000 men in an area of seven or eight million people. Mm -hmm. And the last thing he could afford to do was that. So he had to magnify his numbers by occupation, travel, destroying railroads, destroying armories and things like that. And the, the piece, one of the things that I, maybe for the lay historian that you, that can be lost, but you really bring up here as part of this, this culture making or uh, the, the, the attack from a, a psychological standpoint is you, you make the point that many in the South during the Civil War had never actually been exposed to the war itself. No, they hadn't. It really did take, I wanted to take this one quotation here that uh, from a letter that you had that uh, Sherman wrote to the mayor of Atlanta. And it gets to this piece about one of the reasons for this march to the sea was really to make the Confederacy aware of the scope and scale of the war in ways that frankly they had been able to avoid. He writes this to the mayor of Atlanta. Now that war comes home to you, you feel very different. You deprecate its horrors, but did not feel them when you sent carloads of soldiers and ammunition and molded shells and shot to carry into Kentucky and Tennessee to desolate the homes of hundreds and thousands of good people who only asked to live in peace at their old homes and under the government of their inheritance. But these comparisons are idle. I want peace and believe it can only be reached through union and war. And I will ever conduct war with a view to perfect and early success. Yeah. He, he felt that the only way the union could be reunited and save, you know, they lost 700,000, both sides lost almost 700,000 people. But to stop the killing was to get the war over as quickly as possible. And that meant you had to get into the South and you had to attack the pretensions of the South, not just the manpower or the armament. You had to expose that it was a shell, that it wasn't an industrial power, that it wasn't uh, tougher or braver than Northern Western armies. And he did that. And it's kind of a theme that I don't want to get political on contemporary things, but when you were talking after October 7th, mm. so you have these 2,000 gunmen that go in and they slaughter if civilians, and they sort of promulgate the idea that they love death more than life, and they suggest that uh, they're religiously inspired in a martial culture in the way that these Jewish civilians were not, and therefore they're deadly and lethal, even though uh, they don't have a conventional war. And there are four or 500 civilians perhaps that followed him in, and then there was sort of a jubilee, but it's, just, it's very similar to the exchange at Atlanta. Hmm. So then these IDF people that are insurance salesmen, the reservists, they're clerks, and they're sort of written off, I think, in that part of the world as wimpy people, but they're from a democratic society, and they're full of righteous anger. So now they are going in to the tunnels and they're doing these things, and everybody says this is disproportionate and they should stop. And I think they would quote Sherman to effectiveness if they looked at that letter because mm. he, he believed in disproportionality. He said, yeah, what he was basically saying is, if you could get up into the cities of the North and you had won the Battle of Shiloh, you would have done to what I'm doing, but you didn't do it. Right. And so now you're angry, not just at what's happening to you, but you're angry that you can't stop me because you do the same thing that I would and you know that you would do the same thing. And so that's a timeless mem or theme. And I think the Israelis are trying to say, you're sending 7,000 rockets into our cities and you're not telling us, you're not dropping leaf leaflets. Mm -hmm. It's designed to kill civilians. And you went in and murdered 
1,100 civilians. And now you're angry, not because we're doing anything different than you are, but we're more effective than what you were. If you were killing 7,000, if you sent in 7,000 rockets and wiped out 100,000 Israelis, you'd be jubilant, but you can't do it. And that's what he was telling the Southerners. You would do exactly what I'm doing in Atlanta, and you can't do it, and I'm gonna remind you you can't do it, and I'm gonna remind you what you caused, and I'm gonna puncture this balloon of the plantation class. He, he had almost a pathological hatred of the plantation class. Yeah, and I, I think one of the interesting things which you see certainly in Patton's rhetoric about the Nazis, is in part his own personal visceral beliefs, but also part of his way of organizing and encouraging and inspiring his troops as well. You note here several times that the, uh, one of the interesting things about the, this move through the South was it wasn't only the first time that many in the South had actually been exposed to war, it was also some of the first times that these, this army of the West, these soldiers from the West, had actually been exposed to this Southern culture. Yeah, they, have. they had not had reason to be in the South prior, and now they were seeing this, and, and because of that democratic ethos that they had lived in the West, uh, they, they themselves, were becoming angrier at what they angrier were Angrier every day, and it was a tripart anger. The first part was sub, uh, focused on the plantation. They would go through these swaths of Georgia, and they'd see these, Hal Cobb, the mayor of the governor of Georgia, beautiful. And then they would look at the tenant, the slave quarters. And then they would look at the poor white people who were the slave drivers, and, and they would say that the plantation class despises the white free class as illiterate, crude, because they have not allowed a middle class to it. Because cotton was so valuable. It was, the greatest, it was the greatest foreign exchange earner for the entire United States from 1850 to 1860. The second thing they've noticed was they'd heard from these Southerners that slavery was a natural consequence of, of inferior, inferiority, sort of Aristotle's idea of a natural slave, whom they quoted all the time. But they went in and they found people, even in slavery, that were well-spoken. And Sherman's talking, and when he gets to Savannah, he meets an African-American ex-slave, and he says this man is so well-spoken, mm -hmm. he outlined the entire problem. And then when he, he freed these slaves, a lot of Northerners who said they were abolitionist, and he wasn't a, a fervent abolitionist. In fact, he was criticized being not doing enough, but he actually got along with African-Americans. So he got there and he said, where is this bridge? Where is the best world? And he realized that these guys had lived their whole life there and they mm -hmm. were unlike the plantation class. They did physical labor and they were the best people to build bridges and cut trees and he enlisted them, cooks, everything. So they had this moving army that was swelled by 30, 30, 20, 30,000 freed slaves. And mm -hmm. there was, Northerners had never seen a black person so they had all of this propaganda. When they met them, they liked them, mm. and they felt that they should be liberated. Mm -hmm. And then the final thing was they saw the poor white cl working class, not working class, but just, and they'd never seen such poverty. Mm. Some of the letters say the white working class, or the white poor of the South lived worse than African slaves. They were treated terribly, and there's no small viable farming. They either have to work for plantations or they work as teamsters or they work on a railroad, but they don't have any property. And they deliberately bypassed those homes. They did not burn them, they did not attack them. They basically attacked Confederate infrastructure, rails, armories, post office, government buildings, mm -hmm. and plantations, and the plant fields of the plantation. And that was very effective in a propaganda sense because they won the goodwill of all of the African American, four million of them in the Confederacy in total. A lot of them were in Georgia and the Carolinas where they went through. Then they did not, it was hard for poor whites that, that were fighting for the Confederacy because here was a man who was sort of playing on or encouraging the resentment of the plantation class. They were all cavalry officers. Right. Most. There are some exceptions, Nathan Bedford Forrest. When Wade Hampton was probably the wealthiest man in the Carolinas, when they saw him uh, during the 
pharmacist. I mean, they said they, he dripped insolence, they said. And mm -hmm. they, all of these colonels and majors in Sherman Army, they were just furious. The way he, they said he was haughty and he was aristocratic. And he didn't, they, he didn't treat his subordinates the way that Sherman treated his. Sherman mm -hmm. got all the people around him. Yeah. And he treated them as his peers. Yep. And they had input, and they and they criticized each other, and they went back. That there was no hierarchy. The Confederacy was built on the same principles of the sociology the of the South. Yep. I want to bring us to a close here and draft off of where the the uh, the current events connection that you just made with October seventh and disproportionality, um, and again, thinking about irony and the sense that Sherman's violence was really geared towards ending the war sooner. The disproportionality, if that can be said, of the IDF is geared towards ending whatever conflict is there sooner. And I want to draw out this, this last uh, piece where you um, raise an interesting question for uh, lowercase l liberalism and how it understands war. Um, because in this, there's a, there's a sense of uh, not only irony, but um, the times when war can be, is necessary. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll read this and I'll get your most historians have uniformly and rightly favored the Union cause and the war for abolition. Yet as most moderns, they have felt that war itself is an aberration, a tragedy, not as the Greeks believed, something inevitable to the human condition, much less often a necessary tool to destroy evil. A dilemma arises. Slavery is evil and Sherman is brutal. Yet brutality was necessary to end slavery and win the war. What are we to do then with Sherman, whose savagery helped to dismantle a racist South? If Sherman is considered too cruel, if he sounds too fanatical, then the logical antithesis is that he should have been far easier on those fanatics who promoted slavery. If he is to be blamed for wrecking the plantation class, then he must be praised for his effort in the cause to free the slave. I'll close here. It is a hard thing for contemporary liberalism again, lowercase l, to envision war was not always evil, but is sometimes very necessary and very necessarily brutal if great evil is to disappear. Well, I think I could make a sweeping statement. No war was ever won by proportionality. Proportionality gives you Stalingrad for months on end. After World War, when World War II broke out, nobody in the United States said, we're going to go into Yokohama and we're going to sink seven Japanese battleships like they did to Pearl Harbor and then we're going to end the cycle of violence. Nobody said that. They wanted to be disproportionate. In fact, even many people on the left looked at Ukraine, and I think rightly so. They're victims of aggression. We're going to give them better weapons than the Russians did and we want them to be disproportionate. Nobody is saying, the people, many of the people who are calling for restraint on the IDF are telling the Ukrainian army You've got to go and you've got to attack depots inside Russia. You, if you, if there's a Russian staging area and they've got bridges and infrastructure in Crimea, and they have dock works, then blast them with our HIMARS, and they do. But nobody's saying to them, "We got to watch out for collateral damage. You better drop leaflets. Can you text the people of Crimea? I mean, they're Ukrainian, hmm. many of them. Nobody does that. It, so, I think everybody would be well advised when they're looking at the IDF in Gaza to also look at an exchange of letters between William Tecumseh Sherman and John Bell Hood mm. because they almost mirror image the dilemma that we're looking at right now. John Bell Hood says, how dare you go into, into Atlanta and how dare you put your army there so if we shell you, and Sherman says, I'm in your city because that's what you do. You hide behind civilians. And then when you can't hide behind them anymore because I took your city from you and I'm rooting them out, the terrorists and the sympathizers, and you, I'm going to pay you back, then all of a sudden you want to quote the laws of war. But don't preach your bottled piety to me. And it's sort of like 
the IDF had said the last thing we want to do from our experience of trying to stop rocketeering from Gaza is go into Gaza City. We never want to go in there. They had decided that by 2015, 16, and then they went in and a few times and it was a disaster, they thought, for them. So they only went in there because they had seen a level of evil and barbarity and savagery that I think the Western world had never seen before, uh, not in 50 years. I mean, there were things that were, we can't speak about that were perpetrated on Israeli civilians. Mm -hmm. So they go in there and all of a sudden the culture that produces Hamas, and I don't think it was completely hijacked, and this is another similar argument. A lot of people in the South said, go over to the Carolinas. They started it. We didn't start it. And Sherman said, I'm sorry, you joined the Confederacy. And somebody gave them the green light. So I'm going to deal with them next. But right now I'm dealing with you. And it's the same idea that all of a sudden everybody in Gaza, uh, and some of them are tragic. They're used as there's innocent yes. civilian shields that are being shot by Hamas. But a lot of people who are protesting are pro-Hamas. And people feel, you can't do this. But nobody said that on October 7th. And so Sherman's larger point is that when aggressors start a war, they attend it to be disproportionate. And they want to commit all sorts of atrocities, illiberal, non-consensual society aggressors. And then when the society is finally riled in horror to mobilize and to say there are no restraints on us, like us in World War II, mm -hmm. then they apply all of the advantages of a consensual society. They unite everybody. They have superior technology. They even win the hearts and minds or they make it difficult for the enemy to, be, to demonize them the way they conduct war. I mean, in the case of the idea if they text our apartment buildings, they mm -hmm. drop leaflets. Mm -hmm. And then they go medieval. And when they go medieval, suddenly the perpetrator said, as John Bill Hood said, you can't do this. And someone like Sherman says, we didn't start it. You started it. You started a time of peace. What Sherman said about the Homesteaders of Kentucky was pretty much about the kibbutzes in southern Israel. Mm -hmm. They weren't. They were at a. They were at a concert. They were on a holiday. They mm -hmm. were during a time of peace. They were asleep in their beds. Everybody's forgotten that. And so yes, disproportionality is what ends wars. And any time a person calls for proportionality, they're basically calling for something like 1914 to 1918 on the Western Front. And that was because both sides were evenly matched. And each side was trying to find a way to be disproportionate. The Germans tried to introduce gas. Then that, the Allies did it. And then the British tried to go to Gallipoli and get around the back or go to the Middle East. And they couldn't do it. And mm -hmm. finally, they just had to wear each other out. And the funny thing was the Allies won World War I and lost more people than the people who were defeated, the Germans. And so that's what proportionality does. It ends in stalemate and mass death. And if you, uh, if you let, uh, there's a, uh, a, I don't want to quote Ridley Scott or Tony Scott, the mm. famous director, but he made, a, I think, an underappreciated movie, Man on Fire. I don't know if you yeah, ever saw it with Denzel Washington. Denzel Washington, yeah. And there's a scene in there when they have, the cartels or the, the kid have acted barbarically. And a lot of people have been party to it and claim they're just, I'm just a professional. This is what we, I, I'm not, and they unleashed in Zell Washington. And I, one of his supporters says his art is death and he's about ready to make his masterpiece. And if you'll let him go, he will give more justice in an hour than you will. And I don't want to glorify violence, but the point he's trying to make is he didn't start this, and he, unfortunately for the perpetrators, understands how to finish it. And the way I think the world should look at this is, whether you like Israel or not, the IDF is a very effective force. And I would not try to perpetrate or to start or encourage them to fight without restraint. They've always had restraint. Mm -hmm. But if you do something so barbaric so pre-civilizational, you're going to get a Sherman-esque response. And there's no one can call it off. And it's going to be decisive.
Yeah. And that's what Sherman was saying. When I'm done with Georgia and the Carolinas, uh, you're going to, I'm going to make, remember the phrase, I'm going to make Georgia howl. Yeah. And I, when I researched that chapter of the book, I, I went to the South and spoke. I spoke at the University of Tennessee, and I went to Atlanta, and I rented a car from Memphis and went out. And it was amazing how many people still hate him. Yep. In fact, there were people who had in their deeds that you couldn't sell their property to a man, any man named Sherman. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, when you would talk to them, it was sort of the same disconnect. You would say, well, you hated him because he did what? Yeah. And they said, well, he burned. I said, and whose property did he burn? Yeah. And how many people did he kill? He almost ki he didn't kill very many. Right, especially compared to Grant. Grant yes, and you, I would say that. I'd say, yeah. well, you, you must hate Ulysses. No, Grant was a, an upstanding general. He was just a fair fight. I said, he slaughtered you people. He slaughtered you. He lost his own. It was a bloodbath. Sherman ended the war without anybody. Get yes, and, and it always gets back to this Machiavellian yeah. famous thing in The Prince. You, a man can forgive you for killing his father, but not destroying his patrimony, mm -hmm. your patrimony. And he humiliated them, and he destroyed their property. And that's what the IDF is doing. They're humiliating the people who are in Hamas, and they're destroying their infrastructure. They're destroying their tunnels. That's like their plantations. They're destroying their rocketeering, and they are humiliating them. They said, here we are. You, you have a coal of death. You say you like death and that we cling to life. We're yep. here in Gaza City. Come out of the tunnels and let's have it out. But you won't want to do that. You want to fight this way, so I'm going to do this to you. And that's exactly what, it's almost eerie when Sherman said, here I am. You talk about braggadocio and Southern ethos and you're so much uh, morally superior to a debased industrial class of immigrants. Okay, come out. And they didn't do it. Well, Dr. Victor Davis Hansen, our Giles O'Malley Distinguished Visiting Professor, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. This will bring us to the conclusion of this episode of Office Hours with Victor Davis Hansen. We've been going through his uh, very important book, The Soul of Battle, which I can't recommend highly enough. Just some tremendous biographies, but again, uh, applied history in so many ways, as we've seen in this conversation. Is uh, the importance of understanding these leaders and what they mean for today. That certainly is what we're teaching here in the classroom at Pepperdine and the School of Public Policy. I look forward to seeing you next time.